coming up on the wildlife of Dr. Oli. What I am concerned about is a mass in that nasal cavity. Sometimes vet work is detective work. It's a stumper. You saw how snotty and how like... Oh, I picked her nose before we got started. Yeah. <laughs> Bingo, you finally get the answer. Come on, buddy. Sometimes it's like teaching. Yeah. If it weren't for you, I wouldn't be standing here doing this right now, so I thank you. You got it. And sometimes it's like an action movie. We're gonna make Mr. Stubbs bigger, stronger, faster. This is fascinating. White Mountain is hopping today. Sure, I will have to go back in and ask the text because my doctor has about five surgeries today. Okay, we're on our way. She can go back up to mom. I got a couple of prescriptions to fill. You're gonna be okay, Mr. Cuddles. When a prized pet bunny comes in to see the doc. Dr. Holy won't get it fixed. With an uncomfortable issue affecting his undercarriage. We're gonna be okay. We are here with our grand champion, Mr. Cuddles, who is a Holland Lop rabbit. He's had so many first places in bunny shows. He has a big, broad head and just certain details that make him a good show bunny. So what's going on with him today? Um, we think he's a UTI. He's been urinating a lot for... OK, and is it getting worse, or is it about the same Definitely. that it has been? Oh, yeah, he continues to lose hair. Um, his legs are almost bare now. Yeah. And so every morning, my mom or I clean his bottom and then blow dry it dry. Yeah, you guys are definitely taking good care of him, considering what's going on, keeping him nice and clean. I know, it's OK. The judges would not like to see him losing fur all across his legs. And I felt really sad when I saw that, because I didn't know if he was going to be OK. I know, it's scary. Nobody likes coming to the doctor. Mr. Cuddle's career as a show bunny may be cut short by this problem, but his lack of signature fluff could also signal something much more serious. Sad. He's okay. He's at the best place he could be right now, huh? Yeah. It's all right. You're okay. Hopefully, Dr. Oli can figure out what's going on with him. Hello. Hi, Dr. Oli. How are you doing this morning? We are feeling hopeful. Thank well, you. Jill tells me that Mr. Cuddles has urine scalding on his hind limbs. This is usually from prolonged contact with his urine, like sitting in it. He doesn't actually try to assume the position. He simply just pees. But I believe there's a much bigger issue going on in his body. I want to just take a good look at the anatomy down there, for starters. We want to run a urinalysis on him. Things that are going through my mind, he has some kind of a, a problem with his, his ability to urinate, urinary bladder, all the way through the urethra or he has a back injury, which rabbits can be prone to. So perhaps a spinal x-ray as well. So that would be great. We'll try to get the answers today, and then I'll go over everything with you when you come to pick him up, OK? Thank you. Bye, Mr. Cuddles. Bye, Mr. Cuddles. Bye, Mr. Cuddles. Thanks a lot. You got it. That's a good boy. Good boy. I have got you scheduled, and we will see you at 11.30. The clinic is jumping this morning. We are done. When Doc Oli's former apprentice arrives with two feathered friends. I was just coming in to have Dr. Oli take a look at my hawks. We got uh, Dagger, and then I brought his girlfriend, Freya. She's a, she's squawking, but she's a female Harris hawk. And then this is a male Harris hawk. It is hard to pick favorites. You love them all. But I have a special bond with this guy. You know, the sport of falconry, it's ancient. Instead of hunting with a gun or a bow and arrow, you can hunt with a bird. And you catch small stuff, rabbits, ducks, quail. It is always good with an animal like this just for Dr. Oli to take a look. He's a vet who knows about raptors, which is rare. Hey, Doc, how's hey, it going? Hey, Nick. Good how to see are you? Oli. Good seeing you. Thought I'd bring the hawks in for their yearly checkup. Come here, you. I always love seeing well-manned birds. I was in my early teens when I developed a fascination for raptors. And then when I found out you can actually train them and fly with them, I thought, nothing's better than taking your hawk for a walk. So I got into it, and now I'm a master falconer. How old were you when you were my apprentice? I was 15. 15? 15 when I first called you. He helped me get my license. He taught me how to do it. I mean, he's just the most helpful guy. I wouldn't be able to do it without you, so I appreciate it. Well, shoot. 
So are these captive rays or did you trap them? Both of them are captive bred. He's three, she's six months. Harris's hawks are really cool birds. They're known as the wolves of the sky because they're the only raptor that hunts in social groups like a pack. You don't have any fluctuations in weights. I mean, they're staying pretty steady at where yeah, you keep I them. Mean, I'm pretty much flying her at 700 grams. This guy I'm flying at about 620. I gotta keep him at weight because I'm doing the pigeon thing for business. Right. Tell me more about that. We do an all natural pest control thing now. Any place that's got a pigeon problem, um, I just bring the hawks by, we fly them. She's catching about five pigeons a day. He'll catch up to 10. When he catches a pigeon, I'll just give him a little piece of food and he'll get off it. And then he'll go catch another one, go catch another one, go catch another one. Yeah, I imagine once you get the, the pigeons aware yep. of the fact that there's a couple of Harris hawks in the area, they probably just vacate on their own, don't they? Yep. We've had great success. We have apartment complexes, huge HOAs, parking garages. We're getting more work than we can handle right now. I remember when Nick came to me and he was, you know, it's wide eyed wet behind the ears, teenager, just all things raptor, and very excited about wanting to become an apprentice, and I took him on, and now he's become a professional falconer. Kind of a nice uh, transition to see some of my students uh, do so well. Let's have a look at your birds. Just be careful. She can't grab me when she can't see me. Yeah. When captive raptors are nervous, we put a hood on them, and that eliminates all visual stimulus. It basically keeps them calm. What about you? He's a sweetheart. Oh, he's a great bird. I've never had a problem with him. I clipped his beak. He hasn't sharpened it yet. Well, you bite that for me. It's not grossly overgrown. He's a pretty calm guy. I mean, if you can get an emery board on there. The thing with an emery board to sharpen that up is as many strokes as you do on that side, make sure you do the same one and that'll keep that beak even. It'll keep wearing it down and it'll shrink it back up. Okay. Well, uh, Nick, they look great, they feel great. As long as their weights are holding, I'm gonna give them straight A's on their report Thank card you. today. Okay. I think the next thing to do is go watch them fly. Yeah, let's do it. Good boy. You wanna uh, try for old time's sake? Sure. Uh, go. Come on, buddy. Get every bit he of it. chase everything. Tell you what, go, go over there next to that fence. I want to see him fly a little longer distance and call him in, okay? okay? Come on. Go over. Good boy. Come on, buddy. Good boy. Good boy. Yeah, that's, yeah, he's boy. flying really strong, Nick. I've had probably five or six apprentices over the years. It's a sport that hasn't changed for centuries. It's almost like martial arts. I was a sensei to those guys, and now they're my black belt buddies. He's a good boy, Sir Dagger. If it weren't for you, I wouldn't be standing here doing this right now, so I thank you. you I thank you for it. all you did. Pretty good, Dad. I would probably recommend that this dog have an e-collar, because okay. these are the ones that they want to get to. I'll be right with you, okay? Okay. There he is. All right, sweetheart. It's time to solve the mystery of what's ailing Mr. Cuddles. A little gas anesthetic will help him relax enough so Doc can start to look for clues. Easy, babe. Just a little. It's not quite, not quite, but he's getting there. This bunny is obviously suffering from something, otherwise he wouldn't be sitting in his own urine. And you have to be methodical to get to the bottom of it. The way I was taught, you start with a physical exam and you try to find a, a problem. Sometimes the physical exam will actually give you the answer. He's not seeing a lot of abnormal about him. his general anatomy down here. But if not, then you start going through the diagnostics to rule in or rule out the suspected diagnosis. Let me get some urine so we can run a urinalysis later. That's pretty normal <laughs> urine to me. They have really turbid, thick urine like that. Basically, you narrow it down. All right, let's do an x-ray. Go do the voodoo that you do so well. All right. Just like the entire spine, Dr. Oli? Yeah, let's just do a full body lateral. Ooh, hi, little bun bun. OK, then let's hand recover him, because he's going to wake up pretty quickly.
bingo, you finally get the answer. Now that lumbosacral joint doesn't look so hot. This is where they're gonna injure their back if they kick and they're not supported. And you can see on the top of that joint space how much bony proliferation there is. And it's almost closed down completely on the top part of that joint. I think that's our problem. This approach to diagnosing a problem has never failed me. That is what, to me, being a diligent, responsible, and effective veterinarian is all about. Speak you up. Let's go see Mr. Cuddles. All right. I think we got an answer today. Oh my gosh. Didn't find anything anatomically wrong with him at all. Urine was completely normal. Great, okay. Um, but on x-rays, we have some changes. Back here, I want to show you just the spinal anatomy. So this is a vertebrae. That's a disc space, uh -huh. vertebrae disc space, okay? Mm. And then up here in the lumbosacral joint, it's completely occluded near the top. Wow. And if you look up here, there's some bone being laid down. That's what happens when the body's trying to stabilize an unstable situation. Okay. It's spinal arthritis. Oh, wow. And that comes with age? I'm wondering if he didn't injure himself. One of the things that rabbits are prone to is when they're scared and they try to take off and run, they can kick their hind legs hard enough that they can actually damage this lumbosacral joint. Oh, wow. We always kind of cuddle their butts, yeah. is what yeah. I tell people to do. So if he kicks, he's kicking against something. Okay. You know, somebody wasn't supporting him when he was being restrained, and he could have injured that joint. We'll never know. Right. I think he hurts, and he just doesn't want to move to urinate. Yeah, and so that's why he's just sitting in his litter box. Right, exactly. Okay. So I gave him an injection of a time-released anti-inflammatory. This injection should last him at least a month. Oh, great. So okay. I'm going to try to take the pain away, take the inflammation away, see if we can make him a little bit more mobile. If he's active, then he has choices, and he's not just okay. urinating on himself. Right. Hopefully we'll get that urine scald solved and fur growing back on his legs. Yes. Mr. Cuddles, he's a well-decorated 4-H bunny. He should have a very long life. I'm expecting really great results. Oh, he's hungry. I feel really thankful. Dr. Oli actually helped my buddy. <laughs> Got some more? He's brought us a lot of joy and hopefully a beginning of a comfortable retirement for Mr. Cuddles. We'll keep in touch. Okay, bye. Some of Doc Oli's patients may not be the cuddliest, but they still deserve the best care. Today's house call is at a herpetological sanctuary that rescues and rehabs reptiles. Wow, that is about the biggest Asian water monitor I've ever seen. Rowdy the monitored lizard is getting up there in years, but lately he's not living up to his full rowdy potential. Is he having any kind of mobility issues or? Yeah, he's moving much slower. Um, and you'll see when we get to working with him a little bit, his, uh, his front arms especially seem really stiff now. He's getting old. He's about 26. How old is old for a monitor? Does he still have a lot of? 26. Well, 26. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Normally, monitors live about 15, 16 years at best, and he's 26. And I think that is a testament to the fine care that Daniel and staff has given him. He's still kicking. I just don't want to see the day when he's not, but. Yeah. I know that Daniel and the team are really attached to Rowdy, and I fear that they think the end is near. We start talking about him not being with us, that's hard. He's getting old. He's about 26. When he's still kicking, I just don't want to see the day when he's not, but. Yeah. When we start talking about him not being with us, that's hard. I'm very close to him. It's like, you know, a sibling or a child. You know, something happens to him that's, it's, it's, it hurts. He's just been with us so long and I've done so much with him. He's definitely got to be my number one. He's very special to me. I'm probably gonna want to take some x-rays after I examine him, so I'll go grab the x-ray machine. Okay. If you want to bring him, I'll meet you over in the, in the clinic, okay? okay? We'll do that, All absolutely. Right. Sounds right. great. Monitor lizards are a very unique lizard that's native to Africa, Asia, and Australia. What's unique about the monitor lizard is it has a snake-like tongue. It's always testing its environment. That tongue is constantly giving Rowdy information on what's around him, who's around him, and whether or not he needs to be concerned about anything. So Daniel, 
I noticed when he was in his habitat, he was resting his head on the branch, mm -hmm. and but he was standing on these front limbs. Is, do you suppose that was a mechanism for him to take some weight off the front end a little bit? Possibly. When they're basking, when they're wanting to soak up that UV light, they're generally standing. The hind limbs are down on the ground and the front limbs are up, and that exposes as much of their body to sunlight as possible. What I noticed, though, he had his head resting on that log. That was my first clue that he's trying to use his head to take some of the weight off his elbows. Hey, buddy. Eyes look pretty clear. You can say off for me. That's a good man. Quail slits look good. Everything is good in there. That's a good breath. Nice and clear. Heart sounds perfect. Daniel, I got to tell you, I can't believe how tame he is. I mean, I've worked on lizards in zoos, and we have to anesthetize them to get an exam yeah. like this done. He used to move around and be much more mobile than he is now, but we've noticed his arms appear to be stiff. He kind of moves really yeah, rickety, a, like an old I, man. Actually, I'm just what I'm seeing is just a decreased range of motion, it feels like, in this elbow. It does look like he is having a response to pain, yeah, too. He doesn't act like he likes that very yeah. much, so that might be the source of his mobility issues. Let's get those x-rays and see if we can address his mobility issues. Okay. Okay. When you see that ready light, click it all okay. the way down. Okay. Good. Perfect. Hot bang. We got a picture. Nice. Okay. See this elbow right here? There's some demineralization. You see this is fairly normal bone up here. Right. If I blow that up, we get down to the lower part of the humerus. See how it looks kind of moth-eaten? Hmm. You see all these these calcium deposits out here? On the outside? Yeah, on the outside, down at the elbow joint. Mm -hmm. That is indicative of arthritis, and that's why he's not being mobile anymore. Range of motion was definitely decreased in those elbows, and I watched him as he was trying to move with those elbows, even on the slick table, that he just wasn't bending his limbs correctly. 26-year-old elbows, you know? Yeah. I think we can help that. What I would do is we're going to put him on a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory for the discomfort and just monitor his mobility and see how he does with that. Well, if we get another 26 years, I'll be happy. I, I bet you would. <laughs> he may not ever be that spry again, but he should be more spry than he is now once we start therapy. Right. I don't think he'll ever be the rowdy he used to be. Think old man, you know? If rowdy even shows a little inkling, of what his old rowdy self was, I'd be very happy to know that. All right, Jill, I guess we can pack some stuff up here and head up to Mr. Stubbs. All right, sounds good. All right. Ole's next patient also has a mobility challenge. And this is the man of the hour here, mm -hmm. Mr. Yes, Stubbs, yeah. huh? But this one is for a very different reason. Another gator bit his tail off when he was a baby. An alligator with no tail poses some problems for him and we want to see, with a veterinary's opinion, can we design that perfect tail that uh, makes him feel as comfortable as possible and he, and he can act and behave and be as normal as he can as an alligator. Mr. Stubbs had a prosthetic tail that helped, but he's outgrown it. Now Doc Oley and a team, including an anatomy professor and a prosthetist, are going to design him a high-tech upgrade. And we've tried a couple of different ways of getting a good secure fit around this stump. And actually that's the problem where we are right now with the new tail we have to develop. As he's grown so much, he's lost a little bit of the contour on this stump. And so now we're having a hard time keeping a tail on around that big bulge there. And it can just slip right off if he turns the wrong direction. Okay, just do a quick physical exam on him and just make sure he's in good shape all the way around. At 10 years old, Mr. Stubbs should be around six feet long. But without his tail, he's just about three feet. Nice big breast, Mr. Stubbs, please. Alligators' tails are very, very important to them. It represents literally half their body length, about 30% of their total weight. And that tail serves as a fulcrum for the center of gravity. Without his tail, he can't walk properly, and he certainly can't swim properly. So on the land or on the water, Mr. Stubbs has got some issues. Is there any way I could see him walk? We can always try. He does not a big walker these days, but yeah. we'll give it our best shot. You can tell right away that Mr. Stubbs balances off by the way he walks. When you think about someone walking on ice or a wet floor, 
they're taking very small steps, very slow steps, and they're even maybe putting their arms out for balance as they're walking. You can see him doing all the same things. And he's splaying his back legs out wide and then you see to the keep deviation. from falling over. The deviation of that lumbar spine. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which is normally in a straight line, even when they're walking. Yeah, he is really uh, not alligator-esque right now. Yeah, he is really uh, not alligator-esque right now. Doc Oley is consulting with a team of experts on an unusual case. Mr. Stubbs the alligator is struggling. One of our big concerns is that he's going to develop some sort of arthritis or musculoskeletal syndrome beyond Absolutely. that. Absolutely. He's loading all his, his joints incorrectly, and that cartilage is going to change, and that's going to lead to arthritis in the long run. Are there arthritis medicine for well, alligators? We can treat arthritis in reptiles. The thing about arthritis is it doesn't get better. It only gets worse. Much better to prevent it than to treat it. The best solution for Mr. Stubbs is to make his body mechanics more natural. And I think a new an improved prosthetic tail is gonna help him avoid a very painful future. Where he needs the weight is at the base of that prosthetic. There's a way to design it where we could have the bulk of the weight right at the stump and then have a lighter tail in the end that he can still use, but he doesn't need that weight out at the tip. He needs it right over his stump. Luckily for Mr. Stubbs, prosthetic technology is improving every day, and that can help solve this dilemma of a really well-loved alligator with no tail. We're going to bring him into the laboratory where we can measure how he moves. We've got a really advanced camera system that can capture the movement of Mr. Stubbs in our room. We're going to assess his walking without the tail, and then when the tail's complete, we'll do it again and see how that tail actually changes his ability to walk. Mr. Stubbs gets a field trip to Mark's lab so we can get all the information gathered to give him a brand new tail just like Mother Nature intended. So we're gonna use these motion capture markers here and all of those cameras around the room are shooting infrared light that's gonna bounce off these and they see this. So when we take these markers and we put them on Mr. Stubbs in the right place, the computer sees all those markers, it knows where they are in three dimensions so that we can see every part of him moving as he walks back and forth across the lab. Nice, show me where to put him. Okay. Mr. Stubbs is like an action hero in a CGI movie right now. In this lab, we are able to measure in great detail the movement of the human body, or in this case, the body of an alligator. So we'll put these reflective balls all over Mr. Stubbs' body, and we'll get a baseline for how he's walking. Okay, I think he's ready. All right, let's see this. This is fascinating. And now you can see when he's moving, the computer's seeing it in real time. Oh, yeah. I see that, every sensor. Oh, that's cool. He's just swinging it. I mean, he right. just has to throw those hind legs to be able to walk it. He's almost bending in half just to keep himself from tipping over. Your eyes can tell you everything. The computer can tell you everything plus some. This detailed information tells the prosthetic team everything they need to know to design the perfect new tail for Mr. Stubbs. A 3D printer prints a mold that they will use to make the prosthetic. He's like the $6 million alligator. We're gonna make Mr. Stubbs bigger, stronger, faster, just like the bionic man. Good job, Mr. Stubbs. Yeah, she is. Good to rock and roll. Thank you. Staple gun's already on your tray. All right. It's a busy day in the OR. A couple skin staples in, we're done. When a beloved German shepherd who just can't shake a runny nose Hey, Manding. Arrives for a closer look. Hey, good girl. I brought in my nine-year-old German Shepherd, Mandy, and she's been having recurrent nasal infections. I'm feeling sleepy? She sneezes, and there is um, some green discharge and some crust, like dog boogers. But I kind of knew was, there was something infectious going on. One, two, three. Come on, girlfriend. Did you check her in this morning? I did. Did she say it's, has it been bloody or has it just been mucus? Just the mucus. So I saw Mandy about six months ago for this unilateral or one-sided snotty nose. Very simply, we started her on antibiotics. The discharge went away, but it came back.
So now Doc Oli wants to scope Mandy's nose to find out if there's something more serious causing her sniffles. You're OK. I'm going to try to do this just under sedation rather than general anesthesia. All right, Mandy, hopefully you'll cooperate with us today. What I am really concerned about is a mass in that nasal cavity, some kind of tumor or polyp, because it's very difficult to operate in, in that narrow space in a dog. See if I can see anything unusual. I know. It's, it's uncomfortable hanging there. She's a very sweet German Shepherd, very protective of me. In her prime, she and I would hike the woods of Germany, literally like five miles up mountains. And now she's kind of slowed down. So now we just hike the paths around here. She's just a wonderful dog. My only worry is what he's going to find. You're right, you're right, you're right. You're right, you're right, you're right. I brought in my nine-year-old German Shepherd, Mandy, and she's been having recurrent nasal infections. Let's see if I can see anything unusual. We really love Dr. Oli. Um, we really trust him. My only worry is what he's going to find. Well, I can see a bunch of snot, that's for sure. And what I can see in there looks pretty normal. You did good, girlfriend. Sometimes you have to treat these cases like a detective, systematically looking for clues and eliminating causes. OK, we'll go with a scope next. I can't see anything really concerning looking in the front side of her nasal cavity. So I want to be back behind the soft palate, looking back towards the front of her nose to examine that portion of the nasal cavity. Hold the scope. OK, that's good. I'm not seeing anything, nothing. And I got a good look back there too. So here, we'll get this out of your mouth. All right, Mindy. I want to do a dental probe on her. OK. An abscess tooth can also cause a runny nose. So I definitely want to rule that out. Nothing on that side. If it's a tooth, this is usually the offending tooth. Going all the way around on a dental probe, I'm not seeing anything. Good girl. There's one more way for me to get a look into Mandy's head. If there's a tumor, it should show up on an x-ray. Thank you. All right, two x-ray. I want a perfectly symmetrical skull x-ray on her. Shooting. Dr. Oli, x-ray up. Just trying to find the source of this discharge is the goal here. When I look at the trabecular bone, it looks like this fine lacy bone right here. That's all pretty normal on both sides. The good news is the x-ray doesn't show any evidence of a tumor or any other problem that I can see readily in Mandy's head. I had a dachshund one time that had the same thing and couldn't figure it out, couldn't figure it out. And then one day, the dachshund had this sneezing fit and blew out a piece of foam that oh, like, wow. was chewing on a toy or something. <laughs> Finally yeah. fixed itself. I think she's got a foreign body up that nose, and it's just going to have to work itself out. The business end of Mandy, and every dog is its nose. I mean, that's its primary sense that it uses to navigate through this world. And it's not uncommon for them to sniff something up there and get it stuck. Good naps, Mandy. OK, go ahead and head on down. I have kind of a crazy practice in that I'm in and out of town quite a bit. Doc Oli's small patients come in the front door of the clinic, but the big boys wait out back. These 16 hands. Henry the horse has a persistent problem with his nose and mouth, so he's back for a follow-up with Dr. Oli. Henry periodically has some discharge on one of his nostrils. It's mucus, and sometimes food will actually come through it, and it's bad. So this thing is just not going away, this nasal discharge? Not completely. It's normally in the mornings, and it's always the right side. We did his teeth how long ago? A couple of months ago? Yes. We identified a fistulous tract at his number eight molar. These fistulous tracts are beneficial for draining infection, but they can become problematic if they become little highways for bacteria to travel up and down. This could be what's causing Henry's snotty nose, but there could be something more serious, like an abscess tooth. Let's just take x-rays of him and just see if we have you know, a root abscess or if it's just those fistulous tracts. If we don't have to pull the tooth, that's going to be our first choice. Good. I've only had him a few months now, but he's a good horse. Come on, Henry. I want him to be as healthy as I can make him. Let's rule out a bad tooth. So I'm going to give him something to just calm him down a little bit. 
I'm really hoping we could avoid pulling this molar. That's a really complicated thing for a horse. Oh, easy, easy. Horses spend their entire life grinding the upper surface, their upper molars against their lower molars. If we don't have an upper molar there any longer, that lower molar, the opposing tooth on the lower side, is going to continue to grow. So he's going to have a peak in his mouth constantly that's going to need chronic dental work. And horses don't like dental work any more than people do. The tooth we're looking at is about right here. Okay. Okay, let's try this thing. Ready? <laughs> Close to his face as he'll let you do it. Ready? I'm going to miss the top part of the jaw. <laughs> you got to hold it higher towards the ceiling, kind of higher. Easy. I'm losing them, guys. Oh, Easy. stop it. Ready? Stay still. Easy. Whoa. Oh, come on. <sighs> I gave him a sedative that should have got him very relaxed. This thing is heavy. He was still more in control than I really wanted him to be. Okay, go. Oh, no. 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 Don't go. This thing is heavy. He was still more in control than I really wanted him to be. Here we go. Oh, no, no. Doc Oley is trying to get a look inside Henry's mouth. But even with sedation, Henry's not having it. You got to hold it higher. Because of his alertness, it took us several attempts to get the views that I needed. It's a screwed. OK, I'm going to do it again. It's just the challenge of veterinary medicine. All right. I think we got it. By a hair. I think he's ready to go. Probably didn't want to be around here any longer. Probably not. <laughs> so I'm going to send Henry home and take a look at these images, and that'll determine what we're going to do next. Good man, Henry. Good man. OK, catch you later. Thanks, Doc. Let's go inside and do this, because I want to get the orientation right, OK? OK, so Joe, you can see at the base of these teeth, there's root prongs, if you will, that are anchoring that tooth into the bone of the jaw. If we had any kind of major disease going on in there, like a root tooth abscess, we wouldn't see those prongs because that tooth is getting absorbed away by the infection. But we're not seeing that. Okay. Not the tooth's fault. It's these fistulous tracts. I want to find a way to close up those little tunnels Henry's developed between the tooth and the sinuses. I have an idea for something that just might work. I've never done it with a horse, but there's a periodontal product that we use in small animals to help attach teeth to the mouth, and it kind of fills in that defect in the mouth. I think the plan is what we'll do is we'll get them back in. We're going to pack those fistulas with this product and see if we can stop it. Awesome. Sounds great. All right. We have a drop off coming down. This is a small laceration, about three inches. All right. Bev, sorry to leave you that kind of a mess. No worries, doctor. Definitely put a belly bandage on her because you've got weepers from the skin. Gotcha. Hey, Mandy. Well, hello there. Hi. Mandy, the German Shepherd's mom, is back to get Doc Oley's verdict on what's happening with her favorite girl. First thing I did is I went up the nose. Nothing. Everything looked normal there. You saw how snotty and how, like... Oh, I picked her nose before we got I, started. Yeah, and I purposely didn't, <laughs> you know, because I wanted you to see what it looked like. So I wanted to take an x-ray, and I'll show you. Mm -hmm. Septum's intact. Everything looks good. That fine lacy bone that we can see is a good thing because right. nasal tumors and polyps and things like that, oftentimes this is just solid gray. So basically my conclusion is, is that more than likely she's got a foreign body up in that nose. Could be part of a grass on. Yeah, 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 yeah. She's see. an avid sniffer. I was really worried there could be like a cancerous tumor or something. She's nine, she's a shepherd. And you know, you're always worried about something worse. And that's not it at all, big really. And it's gonna work itself out. In the meantime, we're just gonna symptomatically treat her with the antibiotics. Okay. And we'll just keep doing that till one day um, she either sneezes this thing out of her or the body took care of it and, and cleaned it up on its okay. own. Well, I guess that's good news. It's great news. Lisa's very attached to Mandy, as it should be. I mean, people should be attached to their dogs. And other than her having to pick Mandy's nose every day, which is probably affecting Lisa's quality of life, it appears as though Mandy's quality of life is just fine. Thank you for doing a thorough uh, workup. You got it. We'll have her right up for All right. You. Good girl, mamas, let's go. Ah, there's Look. my baby. You're okay. Yeah, she you're is. okay. Oh, 
mama, yes. and you. I'm so good you're okay. We were worried about you. She did great for us today. Yeah. This is wonderful. Thank God everything checked out. Let's go, baby. Good job, baby girl. Doc Oli is heading to Phoenix to follow up with Mr. Stubbs. This alligator lost his tail as a baby, and Doc Oli's consulting with the team that's going to make him whole. All right. Oh. The masterpiece, huh? If this high-tech prosthetic tail works, Mr. Stubbs is going to move much better and have much less pain as he ages. Oh, wow. Already, I like it. So right off the bat, if you feel the weight of it, so we move the center of gravity forward. I like the fact that the, there's no fulcrum point. I like the lacing system as well. It looks a lot like it's going to be easier to apply to. So I notice it's rigid and it's like pretty sticky in here too. Is this going to stay soft and sticky for him? That's the idea, is that that will be cushioning, but it'll be cushioning that grips that tail and keeps it from sliding back. That's a masterpiece. This type of work has a wide application in veterinary medicine because there's a lot of animals that lose parts, things that animals definitely need functionally, as in Mr. Stubbs. So I am excited to be part of it. Hey, it's Mr. Stubbs. All right. First fit. Let's see. Oh, that That's fits right good on so there. far. Yep, there you go. That looks like that's the fit. It's not moving. It's on there. So just as we did with the first movement without the tail, we're going to record him walking again. So we can do a side-by-side -side comparison and actually see the differences in movement with and without the tail in a very high resolution. So we are going to observe through this 3D animation, does that tail improve his gait? All right, Stubbs, how about it? Oh. Going on his own. You can do record. it, Stubbs. You can oh. see. Oh, OK. Yeah, he's out. Technical difficulties. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing we can't fix. This is why we're doing the trial and error. That's right. We've got to keep tweaking this every single time. If it won't seat any further down, we may need to remove some of the material yeah, from deep yeah, inside yeah. there. This scar piece right here has to really sit right in that foam there. Gotcha. He's ready. There we go. Yeah. That's right up where it needs to be. He's like a debutante at the ball getting a corset on. <laughs> All right, Mr. Stubbs, let's see what you got. Come on, Stubbs. Want to take a couple steps for us? All right, Stubbs. How about it? Want to take a couple steps for us? He's going to go. Do it, Stubbs. There we go. There we go. Nice. Come on, Stubbs. You can do it. Good job. Man, I'm psyched. Look at that. Come on, Stubbs. Dr. Oli and the team have fitted Mr. Stubbs with a new prosthetic tail to help him be a normal alligator. Uh, keep coming. Look how keep straight going. That is. Keep going. Good job. You can really watch that foot. That foot's not sticking out to the side. You can really yeah. see it staying in place. Vast improvement. It was very dramatic to see how Mr. Stubbs could ambulate with his tail more like a normal alligator than when he didn't have his tail and was really struggling to, to, to move. So I'm really happy with the change in his gait characteristics. I'm going to call this a biomedical miracle. We have some obligation to be stewards of the animals that find their way into our lives. And an animal that comes to live at a sanctuary deserves the best treatment that science can afford it. Well, thank you, guys. I see myself using this technology in dozens of species that I work with. So I'm going to be walking away as a better veterinarian. What I'm really excited about is to see Mr. Stubbs have that quality of life that he desperately deserves. I think he's going to stay Mr. Stubbs no matter what, even if he's got a big, beautiful prosthetic tail. Bye, Mr. Bye, Stubbs. Bye, Mr. Stubbs. Have a great life. That's a good boy. White Man Animal Hospital, this is Jody. How can I help you? Tell him, buddy. OK. All right, Mr. Sam. Mm. Gosh, it doesn't seem like you've lost any weight. Henry the horse is back at White Mountain for an experimental treatment for his sinus ailment. All right, Henry, be good about it. All right. Dr. Oli has a novel idea that could heal Henry's fistulous tracks, and he needs Melissa, the equine dentist, to help. 
can you swing him and back him into that corner there? Henry has seen Melissa before, and he's met Dr. Oli. And horses have a good memory for people. He's not in love with doing anything like this, but he is a trusting horse. He trusts my decision to bring him here. And he trusts Melissa. The plan is we're going to flush out those, those fistulas. Got all kinds of nasties coming out of there. He's really not packing any feed. He's kind of trying to get up into the gum a little bit. Henry has these tracks, like tiny tunnels, between one of his teeth and his sinus cavity, and that acts as a breeding ground for infection. The first step is to clean out the tracks so we can get them plugged. We're going to apply a osteogenic putty up there, which is a big word for helps to create bone growth and product that we are going to attempt to clog these fistulas with is used pretty extensively in small animal dentistry. I've never used it in a horse, but in theory, it should work. It feels great for me to be able to do innovative things. Using this compound may prove to be a very effective technique. And this is a way that we can actually give Henry back a dry nose and a comfortable mouth. I'm kind of excited to see if this is going to work. Are you? I am very. I'm glad his tooth is viable. This is the first time for me to be able to do something to keep the tooth, because you really want to try to keep the tooth if you can. OK, let's do this thing. All right. Let's apply the putty in there. I made you little sections of it. Oh, and then fish it in there with it. And that? just go in digitally with it. We'll get that in as far as we can. OK, easy. For me to put these mitts inside a horse's mouth, halfway back to the molar, I could do it by field. She can do it by sight. I want this to work well. And with her small hand, she's able to get in there and get the job done. Easy. Uh, 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 easy. You're all right. You're all right. Yeah, that one's a little bit deeper. Don't get too aggressive. It is super thick. Yeah, it is thick. Come on. Come on, Henry. We're almost done, buddy. I have to keep it underneath this chair. Henry. Do you want to try to get him a little yeah, less combative? Let me go grab something. I'll be right back. This is Henry's third dental procedure in about two months. I think Henry's just tired of having his mouth messed with. You see? I touched him up with a little cocktail. Better living through chemistry. Yes, I like it. <laughs> Here we go, Henry. <laughs> That's how we like you. That's the way we do it. Poor guy. Just get it up in there the best you can. That disappeared pretty quick. Took it pretty good. What you do most of the time, Doc, is improvise, right? Improvise, adapt, and overcome. <laughs> Words to live by. What Dr. Oli does is he brainstorms and figures out a way to fix it, you know? This is cool. I've never done this before. OK. Done. That's it. Good right. job. We had to think uh, outside of the box a little bit. You have to figure out a way to solve the problem. And you got to do it well, and you got to do it to the benefit of the animal. To have all that happen is an amazing feeling professionally for me. And this is one day when it did. Post-op stuff is all the water he wants, but no food until the day after tomorrow morning. If he just keeps his tongue off of it for a day and a half, and he doesn't have a chance to disrupt the integrity of that putty, it should already start doing its thing. Dr. Oli came up with a plan, and today we implemented the plan. I like the fact that Doc can think outside the box and and do something that uh, is necessary to, to fix a horse that, that other people couldn't do. Thanks, Doc. All right, we got her done. Good boy. <laughs>